So now we're recording. I think we're recording. Uh, yeah, we're recording now, so cool. Um, so this is 5.3, and this is the fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, you think this is important? Uh, this is what this class is all about. So um, it's a big, big deal. Um, now, there's this theorem here, right, for the fundamental theorem of calculus, and it says if f is continuous on some closed interval, then there's a function g that has an integral that goes from some constant to a variable of a function with respect to t within a to b, and it's continuous, then there's something that's differentiable that is equal to the function in terms of x. Uh, so my g function can be derived and give me a new function that's in terms of x. So I know that seems super funky and that definition is probably not very useful to you at all. So instead of even just going into the random theorem, I'm gonna put it into practice for you, okay? And here is the practice. So what this is saying, and <clears throat> it's, it's uh, uh, I'm going to write it so you guys can see this. So see how this is g prime is equal to f of x, right? But the function that I have is ha has this, right? So it's saying, okay, I'll erase this in a second, um, but I want you guys to see this. So I have g of x is equal to some integral from a to x of f of t dt. <clears throat> but if I take the derivative of f of x with respect to x, I have to take the derivative on the other side as well, right? Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. So if I take the derivative of g on one side of the equation, I have to take the derivative on the other side. Well, what it's saying is g prime of x is going to end up with this thing on the right simply coming up with the function in terms of x. So <clears throat> what's going to happen really is this f of t function, it's going to change from a function in terms of t to a function in terms of x. Okay? That's all it is. That is part one of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Basically, it's telling us that the derivative and the integral are inverses of each other and we end up with the function inside but we need the function inside to be in terms of the variable that's being derived by. Because if I had a integral of a different variable and then took the derivative, wouldn't I end up with zero? Does that make sense to you guys? Okay, cool. So, so let me show you this problem. So the easy way to do this problem is this way. You guys ready? What we end up doing is we substitute the x squared in for t. And then we, so we're going to end up with secant of x to the fourth. And we're going to multiply that with the derivative of x to the fourth. So what is the derivative of x to the fourth? Yeah, so we're going to end up with 4x to the third. So my new, the derivative of this then ends up being 4x to the third times secant of x to the fourth. Now, just to prove it to you, if I'd done the integral, the whole integral piece, um, and it's coming 
actually, I'll, let's just leave it here, and then I'll make the connection in the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus Part 2. I'll come back and visit this, okay? Now, does that make sense to you guys? We're okay? All right, so let me make up another example because I, I just want to make sure. So if I had, all right, let's find the derivative with respect to x of an integral from, who cares what the number is, to, let's call it uh, x of, um, I don't know, um, 6t squared dt. What do you guys think is going to be the answer? That's right, Josh. So we're going to plug in for t the x squared, and then what is the derivative of x? It's 1. So then 1 times 6x squared yields 6x squared, and that's my answer. You want me to give you one more? OK. So let's take the derivative with respect to x of the integral from 6 to x squared of, I don't know, tangent of t dt. Okay, so we should get tangent of x squared, and then the derivative of the upper bound is 2x. We okay? So for this first one, this was the answer. Uh, for this one, that was the answer. And then for this one, that was the answer. Does that make sense? You guys feel like that's not too bad? We're good? All right, cool, cool, cool. Uh, you'll find that me doing it right now, it seems really easy, but when you guys go to practice the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, it's actually gonna be harder for you than the fundamental theorem of calculus part two, which is, funny so for these we don't include a well okay so look so that's a great question Jose I'm about to address that after I show you the fundamental theorem of calculus part two and then I'm gonna go back and revisit part one okay I'll answer that question in just a second all right so the fundamental theorem of calculus part two tells us um, if we have some continuous function and we have this integral going from a to b um, from A to B, uh, what's going to end up happening is, remember, what's capital F for us? Do you guys remember what capital F was in, in uh, uh, 4.9? It's the antiderivative. So the antiderivative evaluated at B minus the antiderivative evaluated at A is the fundamental theorem of calculus part two. So I'm taking the antiderivative and evaluating at the upper bound minus the lower bound. And this kind of leads to, uh, Jose, back to what you and I were talking about, the integral going from A to B being a positive answer and then a negative answer. Um, the reason it's a negative answer when we flip them is because then it becomes the antiderivative of A 
minus the antiderivative of b um, instead of being the antiderivative of b minus the antiderivative of a. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's from, from prior. Now, with that said, let me do an example with it. And then um, I want to go back to address the fundamental theorem of calculus part one. So with this example here, what is the antiderivative of one over x? Remember, what thing gives what gives me that derivative one over x? Correct, ln of x. So this is telling me I'm going to go ln of my b, which is six minus ln of my two. Okay, so if we uh, remember our logs, isn't that six divided by two, or ln of three, right? And you can check that with your calculator if you'd like. Um, they are the exact same answer. That is the fundamental theorem of calculus part two. You're taking the antiderivative and then applying um, the upper and lower bound. But it's always the upper bound minus the lower bound. Does that make sense to you guys? We're okay? All right, uh, let's see, let's do another example. Okay, so this example um, is gonna be a little bit trickier. Um, we need to find the antiderivative of uh, x cubed. So I'm gonna rewrite this as from one to eight of x to the one third. Sorry, my phone. Um, of x to the one third dx. So, uh, remember from the power rule for integration that I gave you guys in five one. Don't I add one to the one to the one third? So the antiderivative of that, and I'll do it before I put in the bounds. The antiderivative. Derivative, sorry, um, of x to the one third is x to the one third plus one over one third plus one, right? So that's going to give me x to the four thirds over four thirds, which simplifies to three over four x to the four thirds. Do you guys agree with that? Now, um, when we do the antiderivative, if we're doing the general case, we're supposed to add that C, correct? But since we have upper and lower bounds, we're not going to do that. So I'm going to go, okay, uh, 3 fourths, uh, 8 to the 4 thirds power minus 3 fourths, uh, 1 to the 4 thirds power. Does that make sense to you guys? So without using a calculator, I'm just not going to use a calculator. Uh, 8 is 2 to the thirds. So the thirds are going to cancel. So 2 to the fourth is 16. That, well, I'll write this all down because if I, I don't want you guys to get confused. Uh, 2 to the third to the four thirds. That's just going to be easy. Um, the threes are going to cancel, so I'm going to get 3 fourths, uh, 2 to the fourth minus 3 over 4. Uh, my apologies. 3 over 4 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 16. And so uh, 3 times 4 is 12 minus 3 fourths. I should get 11 and 1 fourths units squared. Okay?
Does that make sense? Are you guys okay with that? Okay. Now, do me a favor. Uh, I may have made a mistake. You can use your calculator to do this because we have an upper and lower bound and we have a function. So our function, our function here is uh, the x the cube root of x, right? And then with your calculator, you can go through the whole steps of doing this. And you should get the same answer that I got, right? 11.25. Let me just confirm it with my calculator. And that's exactly what I got. Um, why is the unit squared? Are we dealing with area? Oh, wonderful. Uh, 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 yes. So what ends up happening here, um, Jose, and this is the whole connection to uh, what integration is, the whole Riemann sums and the antiderivative, when we were trying to find those, do you remember I was trying to find the area under the curve? Yeah, so since I'm finding the area under the curve, we always end up with units squared. The cube root of x is some curve, and then I'm doing the area under the curve. So cool. Um, yeah, let me make the connection for you guys because that's important. I want you guys to get this. Ah, that sucks. So when you do it with your calculator, right, this function ends up looking something like this right and so if I go from 1 to 8 I'm what I'm looking for with the integral is this area to the x-axis okay and the area is always to the x-axis all right now later on I'm going to do um, two functions but um, um, it'll be the the area between two curves, but first baby steps. Let's 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 build to that. Um, Miranda, how did eight and four thirds go to two? To, okay. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, and I'll I'll write this on the side real real quick so you can see this. So if I have two to the third to the four thirds power. Don't those powers multiply? So really what's happening is I'm getting 2 to the 3rd times 4 to the 3rd. And then that they end up canceling, so I get 2 to the 4th. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, You'll find uh, calculus is terribly terrible in terms of making sure that you guys know your algebra. It's uh, <laughs> it's messed up. Um, I told you guys when we started this class that um, I was really just teaching you guys algebra, right? And uh, has it been true? Yeah, it's it's pretty insane, actually, huh? Um, um, and I, I I I tell people if you can do algebra really well. There's, you can become a math major because it, it, all we really do is it's, it's algebra on steroids. Um, so, uh, and this is reaffirming it for you guys. So there it is. All right, let's do another example. And I, th oh, I have two more examples. Um, and then I'm going to go back to do... Um, I'm going to go back to doing uh, the first um, the first fundamental theorem of calculus to show you guys. Okay, so now now check this out. To do this problem, it's a product. Um, I don't want to deal with it as a product. So first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to 
make it one polynomial function, right? By distributing, by doing the distributive property to this. So then this is gonna be from zero to two and I'm gonna get uh, two y squared minus y plus one. Okay, does that make sense to you guys? Did I do that right? 2y squared minus 2y plus y, yeah. Oh, I made a mistake. Uh, this should be minus y minus one. Yes, yes, thank you, Jose. Cool. Okay, now from here, I'm gonna take the antiderivative of each, right? So when I take the antiderivative of the first term, um, aren't I gonna get two y to the third over three? minus y squared over two minus y, right? And then what we do is we write this line, this such that line, and we put zero and two so we can evaluate. I'm just, I'm showing you an, another way to be able to do this problem. This way I can show the antiderivative without the constant and then the values that I'm uh, evaluating at. That straight line means such that, right? Right, guys? <laughs> okay, so then I'm gonna plug in the two. So I'm gonna go, all right, two times two to the third over three minus two squared over two minus two minus, and then I'm gonna do my brackets because I wanna be disciplined about this, two over three times zero cubed minus one half zero squared minus zero. I'm just trying to show you, um, this part here is my antiderivative with respect to b minus this piece here is my antiderivative with respect to a. Does that make sense? So it's just showing it is the fundamental theorem of calculus um, part two. We okay? All right, cool, 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 cool. All right. Now, uh, let's do some calculations. Uh, two to the third is eight, right? And then to the fourth, so that should be 16 over three minus two minus two, and then minus zero on that side. Do you guys agree with that? So that should be 16 over three minus four. Uh, some people would say that's bad mathematics, but whatever. <laughs> um, and that's gonna be uh, five and a third. So my answer should be one and one third units squared. And again, don't trust me. I don't want you to trust me. Verify it with your calculator, please. Sure. When we type in to like check on the calculator, will we do both? Uh, bumps apart. Will we type in the 2y squared minus y minus 1? So instead of plug plugging in y, you're going to put in x. Oh, okay. Okay. So yeah, because this is in terms of x. Now, it, this does raise something kind of funny. Um, the way you think of things is up and down, right? So you're looking at the area in terms of up and down. This one has actually turned you to look to your side, which is kind of funny. Um, when we get to chapter six, I'm really gonna delve into the pictures so you guys can understand what's happening. But for now, I just want you to see the process. I did the, um, and I should have talked about this, so I kind of appreciate your question, Jose. Um, here you can see that we're doing the integral with respect to y, and so that's why those things had the antiderivative to them. 
Had it been with respect to X, all I would have done is put X in front of or next to each one of those things. Um, if that makes sense. And then, all right, it goes from zero to two and from zero to two, I get 1.33333. So my answer is right. Good, good. Uh, how's this feeling? Is it starting to feel more comfortable for you guys in terms of now we've seen it a couple days and it just like, okay, it's not too, too bad. All right, cool. I'm, I'm really, really glad. Um, you know, yeah, it's, that's super cool. Um, I just want you guys to, to be able to have this and get this and have it really down. Okay, let's do one more example. And then I'm going to go back to that one that we had talked about. Now, this one's a bit tricky. Do you guys remember what the derivative of this guy was? So do you guys remember I gave you a to the x? And I said when we take the derivative of a to the x, do you guys remember? <laughs> oh, that's good. Um, cool. Yes, James, that's awesome. Um, it is 10 to the x ln of 10, right? Um, that is the derivative. So now when we take the antiderivative, if I have the antiderivative of this guy, instead of having that ln of 10 in the um, next to it, we're going to put it in the denominator. So let's just use this. The antiderivative of that is going to be a to the x divided by, that's a terrible ln, divided by ln of a. Does that make sense? Okay. And the reason that that is, is if I took the derivative of the right hand side to get what the function is on the other side I need it to match and so when I took it I would get so here let me just show you so if I take the derivative to both sides right so if I went derivative with respect to x of this guy the integral and the derivative cancel and so I'm going to get a to the x right on this side when I take the derivative don't I get ln of a or a to the x ln of a over ln of a and so don't I get a to the x does that make sense okay just making sure in fact I should probably write my notation a little bit better for you guys because just to be consistent Remember, ln of a is a constant, so I'm not worried about its derivative. So I'm going to get um, a to the x ln of a over ln of a, and that gives me that I, in fact, am right. That is the antiderivative for a to the x. So this, this here, this here, um, is the antiderivative rule for this, okay? So then in the example that we have, when I take the antiderivative of 10 to the x, won't I get 10 to the x over ln of 10? Right? But it's a such that, because we're def we've got a definite integral, it's going to be from 0 to 1. Do you guys agree with that? Okay, that box that I just showed you, that's going to be important. You guys should try to like have that down somewhere. All right, uh, Julian, what's what do you got? You can press your mic if you have a mic and just tell me what you're thinking. Oh, it's, it's 10 to the x because um, notice, uh, 
Notice here, um, I still have a to the x in the numerator. Oh, bummer. Okay, but do you see that it's a to the x there? So all I've done is my a in our problem is 10. Yeah, so then it's 10 to the x over ln of 10. Does that make sense? All right, cool, cool, cool. That's why that box is just a rule for you guys to have. And then I gave you a little like simple proof to show that it is true, but, but that's it. Okay, now to finish this problem, I'm gonna get uh, 10 to the first power over ln of 10 minus 10 to the zero power of ln of 10. And doesn't that give me 10 ln of 10 minus one ln of 10, which isn't that uh, nine ln of 10. And so I know that my integral of 10x dx is equal to nine over ln of 10. Does that make sense to everybody? And again, what's cool is you guys can check this with your calculator. So you should use your calculator now that I've given you all the steps to be able to do it. Uh, would it yes, 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 yes. Um, oops. Still unit squared. Any of these things are, should be units squared, right? Because what are we doing here? We're finding the area under the curve. So it is a unit squared. Good question, Jake. All right, can I go back to um, uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus part one? All right, cool. So check this out. So uh, let me look and see, what was that first problem that we had? Okay, cool. Cool. So it's from one to x to the fourth of secant, and I think it was just t d t, right? With respect to x, that was the that was the problem. So now that we know the fundamental theorem of calculus part two, and we were to plug in. And now, obviously, you guys don't know the integral to secant yet, but that's okay. Um, I just want to show you. Uh, so it's the upper bound minus the lower bound, right? So I'm going to go secant of x to the fourth, then 3x, oh, I'm sorry, that should be 4x to the third, minus secant of 1. But what's the derivative of 1? And so that gives me the answer 4x to the third secant x to the fourth. Does that make sense, Jose, why the one didn't matter? Okay, now <clears throat> let's build on that because, well, you guys opened it up by asking questions, so it's cool. Um, let's do a problem that we could do the antiderivative to. Um, and then go from there. But now what I want to do is I want to have variables in the numerator or in the lower bound and the upper bound. So let's do one that you guys would know. What's something you guys could do easily? How about, uh, how about t to the third, right? So what is the antiderivative of t to the third? I'm not asking you to take the derivative and plug in. I'm not asking you to do it that way. I'm asking you guys to find out what is the antiderivative to t to the third. Cool, thank you. It's t to the fourth over four, right? And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna evaluate it though, if I can, at x 
squared and x to the fourth. So that piece is going to become this, and it's upper bound minus lower bound, correct? Okay, so then t to the fourth is going to become x to the fourth to the fourth over four minus um, x squared to the fourth over four, right? Okay, cool. So then let's just see if we can clean this up. Um, isn't that x to the 16th over 4 minus um, x to the 8th over 4? Okay, now watch this, my friends. What's the derivative of x to the 16th? Isn't that 16x to the 15th over 4 minus 8x to the 7th over 4? Do you guys agree? And so isn't that going to be 4x to the 15th minus 2x to the 7th? Do you guys agree? So what I did in this problem is I did it in order. I did the integral, then after I did the integral or the antiderivative piece, then I took the derivative to it and I got this as an answer. Okay? Now, instead of doing it this way, I'm gonna use the fundamental theorem of calculus part one to do this problem. So let me see if I can remember what it was. It was from x squared to x to the fourth, and we said t cubed, correct? dt. So that would have told us, just plug it in, right? So x to the fourth to the third, and then the derivative of x to the fourth, isn't that x four x to the third? Correct? Okay, then minus, let's just plug in like I told you guys. So it's x squared to the third. And then what's the derivative of x squared? Isn't that 2x? <clears throat> so cool, let's see what happens. x to the fourth to the third power is going to become x to the twelfth and then 2x, and that's going to become x to the 6th. And doesn't that become x to the 4x to the 15th minus 2x to the 7th? Which way would you rather do it? Using part 1. So yeah, so... Um, and what's cool about using part one is there's integrals that you may not know how to do. Like you guys don't know how to do the integral of uh, secant of t. It's a complicated integral. Um, you won't learn that till calc two. And so uh, I think in calc two, I don't remember. Um, I think it is in calc two though. Um, so it's useful to be able to use the fundamental theorem of calculus part one to see that we can do some things. All right, um, does that make sense to you guys? All right, cool. Um, I think I'll leave it here. Um, and then I'll post these two lectures up for you guys so you guys have them. So how do you know when to use part one and part two? So what's cool is, um, for part one, you're gonna use it when you have variables in your integrand and you're taking derivatives of the integral. For part two, it's always gonna be the integral with two numbers of a function. Does that make sense what I'm saying, Miranda? You got it for sure?
Okay, cool. All right, let me stop the recording.